Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm Mira Rubin, and I am delighted to introduce you to Zach Fleischman, CEO of Shark Wheel, a company that has literally reinvented the wheel. No stranger to innovation, Zach was COO of Forsphere, a novel wind and, wor- and water turbine company picked up by the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator as its resident portfolio company for turbines in 2012. He got Shark Wheel into the incubator in 2013 and introduced Shark Wheel to the masses through a Kickstarter campaign that made almost 800 percent of its goal. Now nearly 10 years since its inception, Shark Wheel has won three government grants through the National Science Foundation for its irrigation wheel technology, potentially saving $27,000 per farming season for over 2 million farmers nationwide, greatly minimizing the industry-wide issue of rutting and increasing potential crop yield. Zach, it's very exciting to me to have you here. Just the notion of reinventing the wheel. I just, I heard that and I was already enamored. So please uh, tell us a little bit about how you, how you got into Shark Wheel. Uh, yeah, great question. Thanks for having me on. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, so how did I get involved with Shark Wheel? Uh, my my former life, I was a professional tennis player, and I used to travel around uh, the world, uh, sometimes with a coach. And my tennis coach was was also my fitness trainer. And you know, when you're traveling a lot on the road, you um, you have a lot of downtime. You're taking planes and trains and cars, and you have a lot of downtime. So I do a lot of reading, and I'm kind of obsessed with physics and cosmology. So I was always reading those kind of books. And my my tennis coach used to make fun of me about that. He's like, "Why don't you read something interesting and fun for once?" And I was like, "No, this is what I love." Um, so anyway, one day I was back training in uh, Southern California, and he said, "You're not working out today. You gotta, you gotta, we gotta talk." So he said, one of my clients made a massive scientific discovery, and I know that that's your thing. So would you would you like to meet him, hear about it? And I said, of course. And so anyway, that that was the start of um, uh, of me becoming involved in Shark Wheel. Actually, when I met the inventor of the Shark Wheel, his name is David Patrick, um, it was just for a scientific curiosity of mine, and it was just a fascinating thing. It was the coolest thing I've ever heard, uh, what he had discovered. And so it started off as just me learning about this, wanting to be involved in some capacity, just because I was enamored with what he had discovered. Uh, And he's going to release it next year in 2023. Um, But uh, that's how it started. It ended up turning into a business relationship over time. Um, And that's how I became involved. Amazing. So now before that, you were part of Forsphere, which was a- That's correct. So that was actually how myself and David began our business relationship. I didn't even know about the wheel. Um, he, so we started off as a wind and water turbine company. We were picked up by the LA Clean Tech Incubator, which was founded by Mayor Villa Ragosa. Uh, it was actually started by the city of LA to try to find the most promising clean technologies. Uh, and we were selected as the wind and water company. So we started the company. And uh, long story short, um, this this is almost a year of, of first being introduced to David and he shows up at work and he rolls what's now called the shark wheel down the hallway. And I couldn't believe that this crazy shape could roll. And the shape is a big part of his discovery, but I had seen it as part of nature, it had nothing to do with the wheel whatsoever. And so the, keep in mind, I'd known him for almost a year until he showed me this as a wheel for the first time. And I just couldn't believe it. 
And I said, where, you know, he's like, I can't believe I've never showed this to you. I said, Nope, you never showed it to me. Um, I'm like, how long have you had this thing? And he said, for like seven years. And I said, you've had this for seven years. And, um, so I think that day we called the patent lawyer. I said, we have to, we have to dive into this. You know, it's obvious that this is based on nature. There's gotta be something to this. And anyway, long story short, once we realized that there was real advantages to the shape, that it wasn't just a square looking wheel um, that captured attention. We realized that it really uh, was a business. I, I'm I'm interested in both, actually. I'm interested in four sphere and I'm also interested in shark wheel. And since you started the the shark wheel introduction sort of with four sphere, what happened to the wind and water turbine? It's been collecting dust. Um, so it needs the the right people to to you know to uh, to get it off the ground. We did a lot of work on it. Uh, we have a lot of materials on it, some testing on it. Um, but what happened was we launched a Kickstarter campaign with just an idea. We didn't even know how to make the, our wheel. Uh, it was just an idea. And it just took off. I mean, Discovery Channel called us. They did an episode on us reinventing the wheel. We we're on every major publication overnight. And we got so much attention. And we didn't even have a business set up. I and mean, we didn't have anything. Uh, we didn't even know how to make it. Um, so we had this incredible thing that we didn't realize how viral it was going to go and how much interest it was going to have. Uh, but it forced our hand to put all of our attention, all of our attention and allow the turbine to start collecting dust. So is that, is that something that you have visions of resurrecting at some point? Uh, we do. We, we believe it has a, a real purpose to exist. Again, it's a shape that's found all throughout nature. So it has real advantages. It just needs the right people in place to, to take it to the next level. Um, you know, our first thought is in water desalination. It has an energy recapture system that we had invented that we think is perfect for water desalination, which is really a hot topic, especially here in California with uh, the scarcity of water out here. Um so we think we have a real, uh, you know, technology. Again, it's just about finding the bandwidth and the time to find the right people to to take it over because it's not us that that should be running that. Okay. So uh, just in case somebody who's listening to this or watching this is interested, how would they be able to reach out to you? Zach at sharkwheel.com. Z-A-C-K at sharkwheel.com. Perfect. Okay, great. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. We're always looking for technologies and wind and turbine, I think, it, uh, or water turbine, both are becoming more and more uh, attractive as we're... It's a fascinating technology. I mean, just to touch on it very quickly, it's, you know, every or most every other turbine in the world is, is similar, especially in wind, uh, where... You have, you know, propeller fan blade type of a thing where it spins, it creates a wake of air, and then the next blade strikes that wake of air, just like a helicopter. And then you hear the whop, whop, whop sound. And it's, uh, there's actually something called wind turbine syndrome. It makes people sick. Um, it kills hundreds of thousands of birds per year. There's a lot of issues with the current state of affairs, uh, especially when you look at the ROI and stuff like that. Um so our solution would kill zero birds. It um, it is completely silent. It's it's a, what we call an alternating wake turbine. So it's actually pushing the wake of air or fluid, whatever you know, water or whatever the fluid is, from left to right, the same way that our wheel moves left to right. And so it spins unencumbered by its own wake. It doesn't slap into its own wake of air. So it spins without making noise or or vibration at all. Um, so it's a very smooth, quiet operating um, propeller, if you will. Um, and also when you talk about, you know, water applications in the ocean, it's spherical. And the strongest shape in nature is a sphere. And so when you try to put propeller type blades in the ocean, they frequently break and they have a lot of issues, but a spherical shaped uh, turbine would be very structurally strong. So you did you actually get to the prototype phase with this? Yeah, we, we have videos of it running. Uh, we have, um, you know, 
computer simulations done. We have a lot of materials on it. Uh, we absolutely built prototypes, yes. Beautiful. Well, who knows? This this might be the connection that you need. That would be lovely. So you said something that um, piqued my curiosity because I know the thing about Shark Wheel. And for anybody who's watching this interview, you can see the diagrams behind Zach uh, of the Shark Wheel. This is That's what's being displayed. And you said that the turbine also is based on a natural shape. And I'm wondering if this is part of, if it's, if it's related, if it's the same shape and uh, what some of the magic is behind that discovery that you could share with us. And, and the name Um, also, I want to talk about the origin of the name shark wheel, because that seems like sort of an odd combination. Well, like I said, everything that we do is it copies something in nature. So a shark wheel is exactly the shape of a shark's jaw. Um, I have a picture of a shark wheel with a shark's jaw. Um, so if you just Google shark jaw, you will see that our wheel is an identical shape to that. Uh, it also mirrors many other things in nature as well. Uh, let me just share my screen really quickly. Okay, great. Um, so in this exam, and I have many other, I don't know if this is a perfect example, but um in this particular example, uh, wind or water, or whatever fluid would would enter this shape, um, which it almost looks like a bowling pin cut out inside of a sphere that alternates. So it's a, it's almost a bowling pin uh, if you cut out that shape inside of a sphere and then you alternated it. So the next shape, the shape next to it was an upside down bowling pin and then so forth. So it'd be upside down, right side up, upside down, right side up. And what happens is the air, the fluid exits out of the path of least resistance, which would be the larger pocket. So in what I'm referring to right now would be the bottom of the bowling pin, which is what has a wider base. So it would exit out of that pocket. And then as it spins, it exits out of the opposite pocket as it rotates. So depending on what vantage point you're looking, the air either goes left, right, left, right, left, right, or up, down, up, down, up, down. And as it spins at the equator in the middle, it doesn't hit its own wake. Um, So I have many different diagrams. It's, it's almost hard to know. This is one made out of metal. Um, There's so many different diagrams to, to, to look at. So for Um, folks, let me just say that for anyone interested in seeing this interview, you can go to our website at sustainabilitynow.global instead of .com, and uh, you'll be able to see the um, the interview recording there, and we'll put links to Shark Wheel, and also if, if any of these images are images you can share, Zach, maybe we can post some of those on the website as well. Absolutely, absolutely. This one is actually, in my opinion, fascinating. Um, I think this could have real legs, again, in the hands of the right people. This is an energy recapture system uh, for a car. So think of how they have regenerative braking and it uses the electricity to to power other parts of the car. Or if you have solar panels on the roof of your car, it's really just an energy recapture system. So you're paying, my understanding is, Basically, when you're using fuel, electricity, whether it's an EV, electric vehicle, or a you know, gasoline-powered car, um, the majority of what you're paying for is to move the wind out of the way. You're, you're pushing uh, an object that is not shaped like, say, a missile that is very aerodynamic. You're, you're, you're basically paying to push a box through the air, which, cut, which, which, uh, which takes a lot of energy. And... If you're able to recapture a good percentage of that energy, you would have a much more fuel efficient vehicle. The problem is current turbines, you would have to have this gigantic spinning fan on the front of your car, which which uh, which wouldn't which wouldn't do very well. You get in a fender bender, you might chop up the car in front of you. Um, it's just not a good design. Our design, um, if it, it works at, at almost like a 
what's called a venturi tunnel so it focuses a large stream of air into a very small stream of air we work actually we don't work very well when you just put us out in the air we have to focus the stream to a small point and once you focus the stream to a small point our shape goes bananas this thing spins i mean we think it even has potential to set a guinness book of world records is how fast this thing goes um and so what it would do would be you would funnel the air uh, to the rear of the car and it would just be a very small point where the air would enter. You wouldn't even see these turbines. They would be in, effectively on the inside of the car. The air would flow to that point, spin the turbine and you would power your car. So you wouldn't have to, you know. You wouldn't have this gigantic blade on the front of your car. Uh, this is not the perfect example. Th this is an example of a, you asked if we had built a prototype. This is an example where the air comes from the opposite side. This particular uh, thing is showing you the back side of the turbine, but it would be capturing the air on the front side. And, and as you can see, it's almost like a funnel shape. It, it focuses the air to a smaller point, and then it would spin uh, excuse me, spin these uh, turbines. This was just a version 1.0 that we built. Um, since there is a spinning component, how is it that it would have zero bird or fish kill? So th this is exposed. For, first of all, the, the reason that if you, if you use wind as an example, where you have literally hundreds of thousands of birds killed. So you have a three um, bladed spinning object and what happens is birds think that they can fly between the blades that's what happens it's almost like an optical illusion on how fast that they're going and so they think that they could fly in the middle of the blade and they try to time it and they don't time it very well let's say um ours there's nothing to fly between there's nowhere a bird's not going to try to there's nowhere for it to go. It's just a solid object. So it's not trying to fly inside. There's nothing for it to fly inside of. Um, also, this is an exposed picture. This could be, actually it would be encapsulated. So you couldn't even see the turbine. This wouldn't work very efficiently. This is just a picture, a snapshot of a prototype in progress being built. But this would be, uh, this is the turbine and this part would not be seen visually. It would actually have to be encapsulated where, like I said, only a pinpoint would be exposed. So unless it's a bird the size of a pencil eraser, it gotcha. wouldn't be able to fly in. Wonderful. Amazing. Thank you for that. This yeah. is, it's very exciting. And my mind is reeling with who can I connect you with? Um, and it sounds like that, you know, you really need to offload it because your hands are quite full with shark wheel. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, very much. So my hands are overly full. I'm not trying to run it. I'm not trying to do that. We are looking for somebody to take it over. Um, in general, we see ourselves as an IP company, you know, a think tank, an IP company, and we're trying to have other people uh, that we can partner with that can accelerate our um, our sales, our progress, and our entry into the market. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll come up with a great contact for you. So, so. so the principles that are driving the turbine, are they the same as the principles that are behind Shark Wheel? Uh, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the short answer is yes. The principles behind it is nature. So nature has the most efficient form of motion and it's always a sine wave. So no matter if you look at how ocean waves or radio waves move, it moves in a sinusoidal path. Um, if you look at how the twist of a DNA helix inside your body, it's a sine wave. There's a reason that these shapes exist. If you look at how the planets move around the sun, it's sinusoidal. If you look at how humans walk, right? left, right, left. You don't walk on a tightrope. You walk right, left. It's more balanced. It's more efficient. Um, I, I frequently find more things every couple of weeks about new, interesting things. Like I found out a frog, I heard that a frog's tongue, when it 
tries to capture a fly when it first moves out of its mouth it's actually twisting and moving in a sine wave it's like i never knew that i wouldn't even think of that um another thing that I, I guess you could say this is not really nature but it's interesting nonetheless in in england they use sine wave walls frequently uh because they use less bricks so they're much stronger structurally so when you do a straight wall in England, because of the high winds, you have to use three bricks, the width of three bricks to, to have it structurally strong. But a sine wave shape, you use one layer of brick. And so you're using less bricks to accomplish the same feat because it's structurally stronger to have a sine wave. Now, that's not nature, but it shows, you know, it doesn't matter if you're looking at a fish swimming, a shark, you know, an eel, a, what, what, every, even a dolphin it moves in this sine wave, whereas a shark moved in, in, in a different axis sine wave. Um, so there's, there's many efficient efficiencies you get. Um, if you look at a sidewinder snake, it can stay on top of the sand and move um, because of that. So when you look at our off-road applications, namely our irrigation wheel that we're about to commercialize for the first time after almost five years of R&D and testing with the industry leaders, um, there's a reason why we're staying on top of the surface and not digging trenches into the soil. Uh, we're copying nature. So we didn't just sit down with a pen and paper and try to figure out how to make a good wheel. We, we look to nature. So you're talking about the farming wheel, but that isn't where you guys started. Correct. So how about if you take us from your humble beginnings to the farm wheel? Yep. Um, so our humble beginnings was, where, where do you start? You reinvented the wheel. Where, where, what do you do? Um, well, I can tell you, your options are a lot limited, a lot uh, less, you're, you're, you're more limited when you don't have any money. Um, so you say, well, let's just film like a low budget video, very low budget video. Um, let's create a skateboard wheel because well, it's very come small. Up with that, uh, that, yeah, but how was that even on your radar? To so David, the inventor, was a lifelong skateboarder. His goal in life was to be a professional skateboarder. So he knew the industry very well. Um, and he just wanted to be a part of the industry. And in analyzing it, we realized that it's a good starting point because relatively speaking, it's very small. So the tooling costs are much smaller. There's a lower barrier to entry. There's no regulations you have to go through. Um, it's a market where people only buy wheels. Like for example, if we started in strollers, nobody buys a stroller wheel, they buy a stroller. Right. So in skateboarding, they would actually buy wheels. Um, and it's a healthy replacement wheel market. Uh, another thing is that we could be cool. So starting in skateboarding, there's a cool factor and it could be a really interesting um, product that has a social media following that has great cool content. Again, if you use strollers in, as an example, people are not gonna watch you, you know, go down the street in a stroller. You're not gonna build a huge following from the interest of going one mile an hour walking down the street. So there, there was a lot of reasons why we wanted that to be a starting point where we could build like a strong social media following where I think we have somewhere around 70,000 you know, total followers. Um, so th that's just where we wanted to start. Um, it's also a very high performance industry. I mean, people take our wheels 50 miles an hour down mountain passes with no guardrails and they're sliding, you know, a foot away from the edge of a cliff. It's very, so, you know, if you want to show that your product has high performance and that people can trust its performance, it's a very good place to start. Um, you know, if, if we had started again, just there's a million examples of wheeled industries, but if we just use strollers, you know, they might say, oh, well, okay, it can go one mile an hour down the street. It's not really doing anything. Does it actually work well? Um, so, you know, we have thousands of five-star reviews on Amazon, for example, verified purchase, real reviews that say what it does and what it does very well. And so you were in the skateboard wheel market for a while or started that way. And, yeah. and then the evolution, how does that work? Yeah. So we still are, we still are absolutely, um, you know, growing in that industry, doing very well. Um, but then we expanded. So we moved 
to luggage. Um, and we've just really been an R&D company because we could have just been a highly profitable skateboarding company, but we had a much bigger vision. Um, we we knew we had the what? I'm sorry. What is that bigger vision? Um, well, you know, from a business standpoint, when you, you know, have a product that works better and you can say you reinvented the wheel, you got to take a big picture outlook. Um, you know, there's pros and cons. So the pros are, wow, you know, wheels, there's over a hundred industries that we can enter with this thing. It's almost like, you know, we're a technology. It's almost like, um, you know, Intel or something where you're a piece of a computer, you know, you're, you're, you're a technology that can fit into so many different things. We're almost a technology. We're really like a technology company. And so we can make different products work better. And, you know, our farming wheel can save farmers $26,000 a year. This is not just a funny looking shape. It has real world reasons to exist. So when, you know, when we're trying to figure the cons are, well, how do you build this thing and how do you make it better? You know, people at first are like, wow, that looks incredible. And then they're like, but does it work better? And it's like, you have this bar that you have to improve performance and, you know, not by the slimmest of margins, you have to improve. So if you look at our luggage, which was our second market that we entered, Give we us failed. A, give us a oh, little bit of a timeline. When did you enter the luggage market? market? I'm not going to give you an accurate answer because okay. everything just kind of blurs uh, when you're doing a gazillion <laughs> things every day and staying up till past midnight almost every day. So, so forgive me for not being perfectly accurate, but I'm going to just say that it's we started the development in 2017. Okay, all right. So I'm going to be you know close enough on that. Um, and what happened was we. Um, we, what happened was we failed for almost a year. We, I would say we created the worst luggage caster that's ever been invented for a very long time. Um, and we kept trying to tweak the wheels design, figure out what is going on. Why is this thing performing so poorly? And finally we realized that it actually had nothing to do with the wheel at all. It was the attachment piece that connects the luggage to the wheel. We had to be at a different angle than every other wheel in the world. So, you know, there's no blueprint. It wasn't like, oh, we just Google, well, how do you get a sine wave wheel to fit on luggage? Oh, it's just a different angle in the attachment piece. It's like, no, the, it took a lot of failures to get there. And once we did that, we had the best performing caster. And then we're able to take that, put it on office chairs, put it on toolboxes, put it on furniture, put it on, I mean, the list goes on, you know, industrial carts. So, so the cool thing about being in the wheel industry is once you master one industry, it translates to many other applications. Um, so, and it's easy to scale up the size or scale down the size. It's just about figuring it out. Um, so we moved, you know, into the caster industry next is what we did. Um, but again, we still remain an R and D company. How do we make pallet jack wheels? How do we make forklift wheels? How do we make roller skate wheels? That we didn't even know we could make roller skate wheels because the one weakness of the shark wheel is that it doesn't like to lean or tilt past a certain degree. So it's like we'll never be on motorcycles because when motorcycles turn, they lean. Well, fortunately for us, over ninety percent of all wheeled industries don't lean. But many, you know, some do. And so we just stay away from those industries. Uh, but in roller skating, we we didn't think that we worked. Uh, but once we tested it, r and we figured we we actually do. Um, so, yeah, we've we've entered now pallet jacks, forklifts, uh, industrial carts, different types, educational furniture casters, um, all sorts of different industries. We even have things that are not wheels. So we have flying discs. We we originally licensed it to Whammo, who owns the word Frisbee. Wow. And we created a Frisbee that almost self-corrects in flight. So when you take our Frisbee, you know, you give it to a kid that's never thrown one before, guaranteed they're going to throw a Frisbee and it's going to tail off to the side immediately. With ours, they almost always throw it perfectly straight because it, 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 it goes left, right, left, right, left, right in the air. And it almost like self-corrects. It's really interesting to watch it. That's um, interesting. I mean, that that makes me think about the aeronautics industry, too. Who knows? 
yeah, there's so many applications to this. And again, this all comes, it started with a turbine. So, you know, when you talk about, you know, being more efficient in, in certain, you know, in the air, like you're talking about, absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, we need the right people involved to, to scale it to, to those larger levels. So talk about, talk about the farm wheel and what makes it, because we're a sustainability show. Uh, we're very, very interested in how this invention is going to benefit the environment. Yeah. So in my opinion, it's by far the most exciting thing that we've ever developed and possibly could ever develop. Um, so what happened was we we aired on the TV show Shark Tank on the season finale of season six. And to my recollection, 48 hours later, two farmers showed up at our door uh, before we, you know, it was like before work started, before the, you know, 9 a.m. work day. And they were sitting there waiting for us. And they said, we're pretty sure you guys solved the biggest issue in central pivot irrigation. And we said, awesome. What central pivot irrigation? <laughs> um, so that was the start of us getting an education. Uh, obviously, we knew about you know irrigation, farming, and stuff. It just that specific term wasn't uh, known to us. But um, wait, 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 it's not known to us either. So yeah. maybe you can help us. So basically, it's a moving sprinkler. So most farmland in the United States is irrigated now by central pivot irrigation, which is when you fly over the Midwest and you see all those crop circles, that's because they're irrigating in a circular shape. They are um, using a, a moving sprinkler that's basically a gigantic sprinkler on very large, heavy wheels. And um, it's it's a great way to irrigate. It saves farmers money. It's There's a lot of benefits to using that type of irrigation. The problem is the wheels. So they dig these massively deep ruts or trenches into the soil. So if you can imagine watering dirt turns to mud, and then you try to put something that weighs 300 pounds on top of it, that's just the wheel. Then on top of the wheel, put another 9,000 pounds on top of that wheel and guess, you know, start putting it through the mud. It's like a hot knife through butter. It just pushes the, the soil away from the center. And these machines go in circles over and over in the same circle. And so that, that trench just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And it causes a whole suite of issues that cause farmers to lose profit. And it ruins their machinery. It causes massive headaches. These wheels go flat and they, they can't water the soil. So they lose out on how much crop they're able to produce because they're sitting there driving trucks onto the field, killing more crops, having to jack up these hundreds of pounds of wheels, replace the ti the, the tires. It's, it's a huge issue. And, and, and so also it's compacting the soil. Right. It's compacting the soil. Um, yep. So there's so many issues, but, you know, for over a hundred years, they haven't been able to figure out how to fix it. Um, and then, you know, so what we did was I decided, you know what, I'm going to go through the National Science Foundation. And I'm going to see if they can help fund this massive project that we're not able to self-fund. But I think we have the solution. And I, I just want to ask you, what put them on your map, the National Science Foundation? Why did you think of that? Because, you know, we're weird. Nobody's no, there's not one company out there that puts out anything that says, look, we want to reinvent the wheel and we want to create a whole new shape, the wheel that can do stuff. And, and, and I'm applying for all those things that, that doesn't exist. So you have to go to places that are very broad in their scope. Um, the National Science Foundation will fund anything that benefits society. It can be anything. I mean, the other companies that we met there, they're creating programs to help kids learn in school better. They're help, they're creating um, ways to administer medicine that, you know, um, that helps people that have issues with certain types of administration. There, I mean, it could be anything. I mean, it, it's just all over the map all over the map. You know, it could be 3D printing in space and how they do that and how they're going to build structures on the moon. I mean, it could be anything, absolutely anything. So that's where we fit is when you start getting into anything because nobody's trying to reinvent the wheel. They say not to, they say it's not possible. Right. So 
the National Science Foundation is very unique and amazing because they're looking to fund high risk, high reward technologies. And you have to fit into very specific criteria. I think it's less than 10% of applicants ever win um, an award from them. We were fortunate enough to win three. So it's like when you go to phase one, I think it's roughly nine to 10% of applicants win. And then if you want to win phase two, which is three times the amount of funds, 10% of those companies. So now you're 1% of the companies that applied win phase two. Then you try to win the third, the, it's called phase 2B. And we won that one as well. And the reason that we won it is because we showed best in industry performance. Um, so our solution is a simple geometry change. Um, our front wheel effectively goes left, right, left, like a snake. Our rear wheel that's right behind it goes right, left, right. And it pushes the soil back to where it started. So we have the only wheel in the world that actually pushes the soil toward the center instead of away from the center. Um, there's other benefits of our design that we've been very, you know, we, we interviewed over a hundred different potential customers before we even started the project. And we said, what do we need to build for it to overtake the industry? Like, what, do, like what, what would we build where you would say, I'm going to buy this for sure. And so a couple of people had said something that was, I was about to say half joking, but more than half joking, probably 99% joking. A couple of people said the same thing. They're like, wow, if you could create a wheel that I could fix in like 60 seconds, that would be amazing. You know, and it's like, okay, that's probably not possible, but I'm going to write it down. Um, and they said, obviously we want an airless tire. The problem with an airless tire is that they dig a much deeper trench in the soil, much deeper. So we'd like an airless tire, but we don't buy them because, you know, even though it's a huge headache to, to deal with the flat tires, it's more of a headache to deal with the, the, the extra rutting, um, as they call it. Um, so, you know, we wrote down a, a whole laundry list of what do we need to do? Can we, you know, do 80% of this, 50% of this, 100% of it? So we decided we're going to go for 100%. We want to see even on the ridiculous side, can we develop a wheel that could be fixed in the field in 60 seconds or less? So was that possible? We didn't know, but we we decided, you know, we're going to go for it all. We're going to we're going to go for all of them. Um, so we failed. We failed hard. We succeeded. We succeeded hard for almost five years um, until we we until we figured it out. Um, so we hit every single thing on the checklist and we are now partnered with several industry leaders. We have a massive uh, one that we're going to announce in January. Uh, we're just a few weeks away from, from that announcement. Uh, could be a Fortune 500 company, can't really say, but might be. Um, but yeah, we're already partnered with Ranky, who owns roughly 30% of the industry. That's already uh, out in the public. Um, we have other partners as well. So we start shipping wheels in a few weeks. The, the first shipment starts going out in a couple of weeks um, and we're off to the races. So we solve those problems. And then we're actually already in development um, on our second point of entry, which is for sprayer tractor wheels. Uh, and that's really all about soil compaction. And because we're sweeping left and right and not pressing in one spot over and over again, there's a lot of reason to believe that we have solved soil compaction, which is uh, almost every agriculture application that's out there. Um, so if we solve soil compaction, which we're pretty sure we have, it's game over uh, from a business standpoint. So that's why I'm very excited. About it's our, game on. Or it's game, game on. <laughs> that's, I like that better. I'm going to start using that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, we're very excited uh, about, about that. Um, and it's been about finding the right market fits for us. Um, this was clear, you know, agriculture, at least to my understanding, is the second largest industry in the world. Um, so that's where our focus is going. And, you know, frankly, we are raising money right now. We are in the middle of a round because we have so much interest and it's growing so fast and we haven't even shipped wheels yet. So it's like we're constantly adding to the purchase orders, constantly you know, figuring out how to fund this thing in the early going, because these are, you know, relatively expensive product. Um, so they're very large, you know, heavy products, and it's, it's a little bit different than inventorying skateboard wheels. 
Well, you told me, and I don't recall the number, so I'm going to ask you, what is the price of one of these big wheels? The um, standard ones yeah. before you met it with the shark wheel. So the industry roughly ranges from 700 per wheel to 2000 per wheel, depending on if it's airless, depending on what, you know, there's, I would say, you know, the majority of the sales are somewhere closer to probably $1,100, somewhere in that range, uh, roughly. Um, But, you know, customers are willing to pay if you can give them the benefit. So we're coming into the market, I have to be careful about giving up prices publicly because of our partner relationships. But all I'll say is we're right in the, the heart of the market and we're, we're less expensive than what we consider to be our competitors in the airless tire space. Um, the most commonly purchased wheel right now is a radial tire that is an air filled tire that goes flat, but relatively speaking, it performs very well and we perform a lot better and we're airless and we're almost the same price. So, um, that is what I can say. So we, 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 like, like I said, we checked all the boxes from a performance standpoint and from a pricing standpoint. I also want to address um, the other features, the other benefits that your wheels offer besides the, the lack of rutting and the lack of compaction of the soil. What other advantages that might even show up more in other markets are there to the design of the shark wheel? So is the question, where can we show advantages in other industries? Well, yeah. I mean, like, what are the features of a shark wheel? I think there was something about the amount of traction, the um, how it affects the drivetrain, things like that. Yeah. So when you talk about the drive, so airless tires put more stress on the drivetrain. So the, the, the squishiness of air Like when you push in a tire and you can squish it and well, when you imagine putting thousands of pounds of pressure now and squishing it, well, it really squishes. Um, So that gives a lot of what they call flotation benefits. So the wheel doesn't, it floats more on the soil. It doesn't dig as much. And also it has a cushioning effect on the equipment. So the, the part of the equipment, the drivetrain that's holding the wheel onto the machine, it much prefers a cushion the same way that if you're running, you know, in steel shoes or cushiony, nice, comfy shoes, you much prefer the cushiony one. Um, Well, so does a machine because when it has too much stress on it, it causes premature failures and it will break. And that costs a lot of money, uh, obviously. So we have, Again, we look to nature and we have these modular paddles and I can share my screen if you want to see what it looks like. Um, And again, please describe it for the folks who are just listening. Okay. So can you see my screen here? Yep. Okay. So let me see if here's probably maybe a better picture. So these are, this wheel has 30 paddles on it, what we call paddles. So they're what comprise our tire. So our tire is puzzle pieces and they were modeled. I don't know if you can see it, but it's kind of a V shape. It goes mm-hmm. down in the middle and then it comes back up on the, on the ends. So it models a bird. It's actually modeled after a seagull's wings in flight. So it almost looks like it's flapping its wings as it gets compressed. And, and then as, uh, so, so as, as it gets pushed into the soil, it flexes. And then as it's not pushing into the soil, it returns back to its original position. And so it's approximating what an air-filled tire would do. It's giving that cushioning effect to a certain extent. And so not only are we not digging as much of a rut, not even close, um, but we're also putting less stress on the drivetrain because we've created what's called a compliant design. A compliant design means there's there's a flex to it. There's a cushion to it. There's a forgiveness to it. It's not just metal on metal. Um, so we have created this design, um, as you can see here in the fields, um, that 
that flexes. So it's, it's and, that, and again, that was one of the the things on the wish list. Well, you know, can you give us an airless tire? Can you minimize rutting? Can you fix it, you know, as fast as possible in the field? Not to, so we don't have to wait hours or days to fix it. Can you, you know, uh, create something that doesn't put stress on the drivetrain because all airless tires do. Um, so we, again, we, 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 we tried to check the boxes and we did. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now you had mentioned that there is an investment opportunity and this is time sensitive. Uh, right now we're recording the end of 2022 and I believe your investment opportunity is open until the end of January, 2023. Is that accurate through start? As of today, it's supposed to be active until January 27th. Uh, So that is planned to be the end date. Um, There could be movement on that date uh, in terms of being earlier. At the moment, we're looking at January 27th, 2023 as being the end date on when the public can invest. Uh, Accredited investors that want to invest a larger amount can contact us directly, Zach at Sharkwell.com. But um, we are running a campaign that's open to the public and it's raised... I'm not sure what today's total is, but somewhere around four hundred and seventy thousand dollars, and it's open to the general public. I, th- I think that the minimum investment is three hundred and ninety nine dollars, I believe. Um, but it's at startengine.com slash sharkwheel. Startengine.com slash sharkwheel. Awesome. And your website is sharkwheel.com, right? Uh, well, yeah, for in for our ag side or agriculture side, it's sharkwillagag.com. Okay, great. And um, let me see, there was another question. So you were talking about this um, announcement, and I don't know if there's any kind of deeper teaser you can give us about the announcement that um, Dave is making in uh, 2023. Uh, can you tease us a little bit and get us, uh, give us some direction about where we might be able to follow this? So I'm going to, I'm going to hope that you and David connect and you can do your own interview with him. I don't want to put words into his mouth. Um, but what I can say, um, cause it is, it's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable, accurate, um, groundbreaking cover of Time Magazine level. Um, get ready to buckle your seatbelt once you hear the whole thing. And, you know, he likes to try to make it sound like, oh, it's super simple. You can get it in 20 minutes. It's like when you're talking about the whole universe, it takes more than 20 minutes. You know, <laughs> uh, he just knows it that well, but it takes more than 20 minutes. It's basically like learning a two year college course in however much time you allot for him. So if you're going to give them an hour, just know you're taking two years of full information and condensing it to one hour. Um, So there's a lot to say in a very short period of time. It takes time to to digest everything. And, you know, I had about a million questions. All of them got answered. And now I can answer them all for myself. And not only do I answer them for myself, if you know about science and how it works, the way things get validated are through predictions, um, because your models, if they're accurate, should be able to make very accurate predictions about things. Um, and, you know, just really quickly, like Newton's laws, when when Sir Isaac Newton was alive and beyond his death, he had v- many accurate predictions when you when you talk about you know, we, we use his math to get to the moon, for example, but his math is not accurate. It's really interesting because as you start to go further away on the galactic scale, all of his math fails. Um, so it's not accurate, but it's accurate at certain levels. It's good enough um, for certain distances. Um, anyway, everything that David has predicted, and we're not talking about Nostradamus, you know, silly type predictions that this is like real world things that are obvious once you learn them. This is not like, oh, I believe in some year that something random is going to happen. It has nothing to do with that. 
it's it's real things that are so obvious um it's like you know scientists are baffled why is there a hexagon on top of saturn it's like well that's actually very obvious and very predicted by this um that that's not a surprising thing at all um you know we're why is there a hole the size of the moon uh that they found recently uh inside of the earth how to why is it that size you know well, that's easy. We've known that for over, you know, 10 years. That That's an easy one. Um, there's a lot of easy things that we've made predictions and wrote them all down and documented them. Um, and when I say we, I'm referring to David. This is 100% his discovery. I've just been fortunate to be privy to it. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's it's the coolest thing you'll ever hear. And that's it touches so- on every, it unites every science into one science. So wow. The way that this is the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, when you look at scientists and how the world works today, you have a fracture in the scientists where you have uh, chemists, you know, studying, they're looking at chemistry and they're under the microscope. And then you have biologists that are looking at the body or whatever. And then you have botanists who are looking at the plants. And then you have astrophysicists that are looking up to space and they're, they're, they're focusing so hard on their one little slice of the pie or a slice of a piece of the puzzle that they don't see the whole puzzle. And they're not talking to each other. The botanist isn't on the phone every day with the astrophysicist and the astrophysicist is not on, you know, talking about biology. They're like, well, I, I don't know about biology. I know about astrophysics. It's like, well, no, it's all actually one science. And then they all unite beautifully once you understand it and they're all the same exactly the same and so you don't need an expert in biology to make very obvious predictions about certain things you don't you know i know a lot more uh about biology than a lot of people that have been studying it for 40 years and i've never studied it for five minutes but i still know a lot more about the human body i still know a lot more about it's it's amazing and that's not saying it out of arrogance it's saying it out of i've been fortunate enough to to you know to hear this and to and to learn about it and to see its accuracy over 10 years again it's not like oh i heard something interesting and i'm just going to believe it it's actually like wow everything that comes out every day in science matches perfectly so i'm speechless because for the guy who's talking who's built a company on the reinvention of the wheel to say that this other thing is the coolest thing that we'll ever see uh it that's that's quite the commendation as far as i could tell i you know i'm very very excited to speak with him and and i'm very excited about what you're doing uh reinventing the wheel reinvents every industry it does and it and it benefits society actually and when you look at and when you look at it uh at a deeper level you start to understand that we actually are going to be a contributing factor to lower food prices we're going to be a contributing factor on all these things so it's like well why is the national science foundation funding us do they just want a funny looking wheel no they could care less about what our wheel looks like they could absolutely care less they want to see what we're going to do with these funds and if we're actually going to help people and so not only did we show it from a performance perspective but we showed it from you know uh, benefiting society and intellectual merit perspective as well so there's a lot that goes into this it's not just oh yeah we just we just have this wheel that farmers want to try it it's that's not what it is yeah and and one last thing i have so many questions but i wanted to ask this too you said that you encountered lots of challenges in the production because it, it had never been done before and just for those of us who really have no clue what kinds of challenges did you encounter Oh my gosh, we've had challenges. Every day is a challenge. Uh, we've had failures, challenges. There, there's nothing that's easy uh, ever. Um, so it's just a grind every single day. So, I mean, you know, it was one thing to reinvent the wheel. And then we had to reinvent the mold or the tooling to make the wheel. That was uh, 11 months. 11 months hiring engineers. No, you can't make this is going to cost millions of dollars. Well, you could make it, but then it's never going to come anywhere close to the same cost. 
And it's just, you know, it was just roadblock, 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 roadblock until we figured it out. And, you know, so it wasn't enough to figure out the shape. It was a whole nother thing to figure out, well, how do you make this a mass production at the right price? That was a huge undertaking. Um, so, yeah, it's just been nonstop headaches, to be honest. Um, it's just been brutally tough. Uh, just, you know, surviving failure. Why do we have the worst performing luggage wheel that's ever been made? Why? Well, no one could figure it out. You know, well, what if we do this to the wheel? What it had nothing to do with the wheel. You know, it's like we keep encountering these obstacles and we're writing the book on it as we go. It's like, oh, OK, well, that's what we do. Oh, OK, well, why didn't we know this sooner? You know, and it's like it takes time, unfortunately. Now, the good news is we are largely and when I say largely, I can emphasize that word enough largely done with R&D. Yeah. We are focused on sales for the first time ever. We've only really focused, well, yeah, we have millions in sales, but we've focused on how do we make this? And now we're focused on let's sell this um, for the first time. So right now is that perfect time to come in as an investor because that is our focus. So, you know, other people that came in earlier, well, kudos to them because now they're starting to see where we're heading with this thing um, to some, you know, big places here, but, you know, it's been a process. It's been a long process. It's been a difficult process. We didn't just have this wheel. It was easy and we just sell it and make a lot of money. That's not what it is at all. Um, but we're at a point now where we have enough wheels developed enough technology where we can start translating it very easily to other applications. Now that we get it, we know where we work well, we know where we do not work well. Do you intend to take the company public? That's not currently, as of today, the the leading plan that might happen. But as of today, that's not what we're planning on. Um, we want to build the company up for a short while longer and sell it. That is the plan as of today. We'll see if that happens. Well, it's very, very, very exciting. I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to explain and share with us these truly leading edge inventions and and new potentials. I mean, really reinventing the wheel. I grew up with my father telling me, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And now you've done it. And it's <laughs> really quite miraculous. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It was, it was great. Um, and yeah, can't wait to, uh, can't wait for you to interview David as well. Me too. Me too. So uh, I want to say thank you also to all our listeners. You're the ones that carry the torch, carry this information outward. And to our uh, my partner in crime here at Sustainability Now and our producer, Scott Billy. And that's it for today. Uh, live your best life. Love the world around you. And together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.